What a day. We are playing with some all-stars today. This is the all-star feature store chat that everyone was looking for. Nobody asked for, but we're going to give it to you anyway. (laughs) I am joined by an incredible group that we just got done introducing ourselves. I would do them no justice to try and reintroduce them. So what I did is I recorded them introducing themselves. I'll splice it in here so you guys get an idea of what they're doing, where they're coming from. Hey guys, I'm Vishnu, obviously, and I'm a machine learning engineer at a medical device company called Tesseract Health. We're basically building a new kind of eye imaging device uh, that's designed to be patient operated and outside of the sort of ophthalmologist, optometrist's office. And so I'm working on machine learning, um, sort of like classic computer vision cases, image quality assessment, and also some diagnostic stuff and uh, just learned a lot from people like you in terms of how to do things better for us. I'm Matias Dominguez. I work at uh, LAPI, which is um, last mile sort of everything store, super app um, for Latin America. I'm working as, well, I'm, I'm a tech lead now. Uh, so I'm kind of in charge of the whole uh, you know, data team for the prop prevention, a bigger team. Uh, so I'm, um, you know, data engineer, a machine learning engineer, trying to baking some ML ops into the whole process. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Simar, uh, Simar Kara. Uh, so I, I'm currently working with Intuit as a product manager um, in the ML platform team, specifically focus on feature management aspects of the ML ops. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's been uh, it's been great, you know, trying to enable different data users like data scientists, data analysts, build robust and reliable machine learning pipelines and use cases for Intuit. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a machine learning engineer at iFood. Uh, iFood is a food tech company in Brazil. Uh, and I'm in charge of the machine learning platform team at iPhone. We have several initiatives there. Uh, we tackle making using SageMaker easier at iPhone. We tackle handling the pipeline for the models. We tackle uh, handling the uh, metadata management for the models. And last but not least, we also are developing a feature store internally at iFood uh, to make it easier to, to use features for training and serving. I, I guess we'll talk a lot about about that today. Our whole theme today is around feature stores and really the idea of building a feature store. Do I even need a feature store? I think the reason that we started talking about this is because feature stores are a hot topic right now. And we were wondering, are feature stores for everyone? Do I even need a feature store? And is it worth me trying to go through the level of effort that is involved in, you know, bringing on a new tool. And so we got a bunch of experts in the room here. I am going to kind of defer it off to Matias because he is the one that I was talking to first about this idea of, hey, do I need a feature store? And it's gotten to the point where Matias basically has said, yeah, we should probably look at either building or buying because you were doing something. Matias, maybe you can give us what you were doing, what you have been doing up until now and how that's been working. And then when you realized you needed to switch. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, right now we're in the process of um, trying out a proof of concept with one of the best known feature store vendors right now. Um, so we're, that's, that's where we're at right now. We're actually starting that, that POC next week with them. But for the past almost two years, we at Rappi, we were using, and you know, on the fraud prevention team, we had like our own version of a online feature store. Got right? it. Got and, it. And, Got it. and, but that, you know, tends to, um, yeah. start showing it, it's, uh, it like shortcomings when, when you, when you didn't think about all the things that you have to think 
beforehand, right? In order to actually make a feature store. So the, the requirement back then was, hey, we need to compute these um, like values so we can build better rules for a rule-based system. And, and that's, you know, how it started. So, you know, like we need to know how many, you know, how much money has the customer uh, tried to send to another one in the last day, right? And I had some experience before, you know, my previous job doing exactly that. So um, we, we, we started using MySQL and it's, it's working great. It's, it's what's serving the features right now. It's, what's, it's, it's not even pre-computed values. So we're just uh, actually getting the, like querying that MySQL in real time. And that's working just fine. I mean, it's not like the we're we're getting latency issues, we're getting contention issues. We're it's just working. So what we were talking with uh, about with Dimitri, Dimitris when we when we first started talking about this was, hey, you know, this may actually work for many use cases which where you don't need the whole actual thing, like the whole infra. Like, uh, you know, for example, uh, right now we're, we're a bigger company, right? Uh, we, we, we have like, there's serious F at this point. Um, and, and there's definitely a lot of machine learning use cases in the company. Like you get recommender systems, uh, you know, user segmentation, pricing, um, estimates like ETAs for uh, whenever your order is going to be delivered. Uh, so there's this, there's been like this explosion of different use cases inside the company. And that's why we're taking that route of, hey, you know, we're, uh, there's a lot of duplication. There's a lot of uh, work that that's just being done over and over again. Uh, there's this all these feature values, then these features that could be canonical and could ju be just used in like a hundred different machine learning models right now, but they're not. So everything's like a little silo. Um, so we're trying to develop something that will get rid of that. Um, but let's say when we first started, and when I first started working on this in, in the company, it was like there was no way uh, that two years ago, no one would give us the, the, like the budget to develop something for the whole company that was going to take a long time to, to actually build and that it was going to, I mean, I knew and a lot of people knew uh, that that was like the end goal, right? That was, it was coming sometime, you know, somewhere down the line, we we're going to build this thing, either buy it, because back then there was no one selling it, I think, but, uh, you know, or just trying to build it out component by component. Uh, so, yeah, now it makes sense. Back then it didn't, and it may, you know, it's kind of a buzzword right now. It's kind of like it's everywhere, and there's this, you know, different players coming out, like even AWS, with the SageMaker feature store, uh, like, uh, you know, I, I'm positive in the next year, every cloud vendor that deals with data or machine learning in some way is going to either have their own implementation or have uh, like a deal with someone else that, that they're going to provide that service through them. Um, but, there's a lot of cases in which you you're not gonna you, you don't need the whole thing right like for example what I'm and, and maybe everyone can chime in on this one uh, you're a small company you you don't even have a proven product out yet like does it make sense then to actually go out and either buy or build a feature store yourself like if if you don't even have a, a proven product that's actually market validated because i'm seeing a lot of startups going that route right 
Yeah, yeah. I just want to go back on a few. You said so many good things, Matthias. I want to hear from the other panelists. Just uh, like it sounds like for you, you guys already had something up and running, right? You were serving online features. Uh, what about for other people? Where did you guys start? I'm curious to see, did you guys already have things in place or are, or are you also starting fresh, um, starting to think through actually, all right, what do we actually need? Um, I'm going to reference Neil Lathia's article in a little bit, um, but I just want to ask you guys first, like, where did you guys start in this problem? I'm curious to hear. Yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, so uh, so I'm I'm currently at Intuit, and uh, I mean I think initially it kind of most of the teams were like different groups within the company were building their own you know storage mechanism for for these features. Uh, but but what what started to happen I think is that uh, you know there are more and more use cases coming up, uh, and you know, you have more and more, I think in any organization, you have more and more data scientists and you have a lesser of like, you know, engineers or machine learning engineers to support them. Um, and, and if you think about it, when you're really building some production pipelines, you want robustness mm -hmm. and reliability, right? And, uh, and so that kind of drove a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, bring all those best practices around DevOps, uh, you know, MLOps, basically, like how do we bring those best practices into the machine learning? And that could be applied around storing features also, right? Uh, and and right now, like in the beginning, it was very inefficient the way different teams were doing, like, okay, you know, I need for my use case, this store. So everybody was maybe having their own Dynamo DB to serve online feature or similar kind of mechanism, right? And uh, th they didn't have a lot of support or, or you know that DevOps mindset to really uh, um, you know make it make it much more reliable. So so what we realized over time was that you know there was a need for this uh, centralized kind of a platform where you know data scientists could be enabled to accelerate faster uh, using this capability, so that they don't have to many times reinvent the wheel. Um, First, around if the features already exist, then they don't have to do anything. And secondly, there were all these tools available, uh, which have been tested actually several times beforehand on how to produce these features consistently across online and offline store and bringing those best practices to all use cases so that this mechanism can scale as there were more and more use cases growing across the uh, company and organizations. Um, so I feel like, it's, it's, it was more driven by, you know, how, we, how can we uh, bring more efficiency, more robustness, reliability, uh, and uh, all the best practices around uh, building machine learning pipelines. Got it, got it. Um, thanks, for, thanks for all that, that, that context, Samar. Daniel, how did, how did you guys get started at iFood? Yeah, uh, great, I was just gonna talk about that. Uh, I think our, our role at iFood was kind of similar to what Matthias mentioned. Uh, we, about a year ago, we had a, an online store for features. We used Redis, Redis, uh, Redis cluster for the storage layer. Uh, and it worked well. I mean, Redis is really good for low latency access. Um, but that was it. I mean, uh, we didn't have a online offline parity for features. So, uh, Many machine learning teams build features and store them in Redis, and then it worked for the online prediction cases. Uh, but whenever they went to train their models, they had to query the data and fetch the, the, the historical values for the features and calculate them in a, a whole other different way. Uh, so it was inconsistent uh, and error prone. Um, so, and I mean, that was a year ago, we had fewer options. Uh, we, we took a, a really, really close look at Feast, uh, which uh, is, still exists today, but it's kind of GCP locked, uh, at least as far as, as far as I know, until this, it still is. Um, and also Feast is actually just a storage layer. It does not handle the calculation for the features. So the, the, the role we took at iFood was really focusing on the on the pipeline for processing and trans and transforming data, raw data into aggregated values into features. So uh, right now at iFood we're building uh, 
a feature store, but I mean, feature store is a really big concept and the part we're really focusing the most is the transformation pipeline and making features really easy to declare. Our feature store is declarative. Uh, you declare what you want as a feature and not how, how you want to calculate it and then we handle the rest. Um, there is a really, really, really good article uh, by the guys from Tecton uh, which uh, separates the, the components for a feature store and they have like five components. It's uh, transformation, storing, serving, monitoring and registry for a feature store. Uh, I'd say right now at iFood, we're really, really, we have a really, really nice tool for the transformation part. Um, and we're still building the, or maybe considering buying the other parts, uh, tools for handling the other parts. Uh, I, I forgot who said it, but like, uh, SageMaker just released uh, a feature store, and it's also modular. I mean, you're able to use either the transformation part of SageMaker or either the storing part. They use DynamoDB and Athena, I, I believe, under the, the hood for the online offline storage. Uh, there's Tecton, and there's lots of other options that, that are modular. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the, the biggest learning I've had this last year is that feature store is a really, really broad concept. And, and that article from Tecton really nails it because uh, it's actually lots of components and lots of different moving parts uh, at iFood were handling internally the transformation part. And that's the one that's most tightly coupled to our data lake and to our existing data pipeline flows. Uh, for the other parts, we are also evalu evaluated POCs maybe bring some other tool, maybe build in-house, but that's still in the open. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Daniel. I think all of you guys are clearly playing an incredible leadership role at your companies when it comes to articulating the value of feature stores and talking and thinking about from an architectural perspective, I mean, where is it we want to go? What's the accessibility we want? How do we want to empower different professionals the right way and meet the, meet the needs of the business? You know, I think that's what we all want to do in the entire community. Simmer, I want to start with you and, and get, you know, Matthias and Daniel involved. As a PM, you know, how do you go about gathering requirements for something like a feature store, for something that's a novel concept in architecture and in ML ops, and, and really then customize it to what Intuit is doing, you know, because over time, systems build up in a particular way, right? No system is the same in any two companies. So how do you go about doing that? What does your process look like um, for, for, for sort of leading from a product standpoint on this? Yeah, uh, no, that's a great question. So, so, so the way I usually do it is that you know within Intuit, like we have different groups and different products, right? Uh, like Intuit has TurboTax, you know, it has uh, QuickBooks, uh, you know, and then there is all, also like security risk fraud teams who are working cross cross cutting through the products, and each one of them have their own uh, you know data science use cases, um, whether it's about you know, detecting fraud, or is it about on-site personalization, or you know, similar ones? So, so what I uh, usually do is I, I try to meet like different personas in different organizations. So, of course, the the primary one is a data scientist, and trying to understand, uh, okay, you know, what kind of features do you want to produce? Uh, I mean, so whether you know, now if you talk about security risk and fraud, they will. They will going to be asking about. I want to produce features in real time as soon as possible, so that you know because the the kind of use cases I have is very time sensitive, right? So depending on that need, we have to look at. Okay, now we have to provide capabilities to to produce these real time features, making them available through our online store, um, and also you know having additional uh, parity with an offline store, so that if they want to train also they have a consistent data. And then when I go to analysts, analysts are very much driven by generating reports, uh, certain dashboards and all that. And uh, for them, it, it's most of the time, at least now uh, it's it's batch oriented kind of a workload. Uh, so, so I need to understand, okay, first of all, where are your data sources, right? Um, it will be data lake and similar kind of, uh, you know, uh, stores and then okay, what kind of latencies are you looking for? What is your batch scheduling mechanism? Uh, what kind of triggers do you look at to, to run your jobs? So, so basically I segment, first of all, like different types of personas. And then I try to understand what their specific needs are uh, from a technology standpoint and what is the level of uh, 
you know, expertise in different areas. Like for example, a, uh, you know, a data science. So the most sophisticated one would be a machine learning engineer, right? Because they are well versed with uh, big data technologies, you know, uh, this uh, parallel computing and all those kind of things. So, so for them, we will be sharing or actually providing a lot of API oriented interfaces also. But for for analysts, like they 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 are more they have been spending more time in you know uh, tools uh, for creating dashboards, right? So they are less sophisticated. So depending on their needs, you know we will have some kind of a UI enabled where they don't have to deal a lot a lot of with the backend technologies and uh, technicalities, but rather more focus on their transformation logic, and uh, and then you know providing them easier ways examples to how to access the features. So so basically, I'm saying like depending on what kind of people we're dealing with, and more and more now analysts are also building machine learning pipelines, right? Uh, so we have to adopt accordingly. So it all started with, with very kind of technical, you know, uh, nature of the product. But as we are going every day going along, we are trying to make it much more easier to use self-served and uh, reaching a broader community working on, on machine learning use cases. Yeah, I, I, I love that focus on the personas, on the different aspects of the people that need to use it. And I think it's 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 interesting to hear that even you know analysts are starting to fit into how you are you're thinking about enabling uh, a lot of different data professionals. Uh, Matthias, so your your title is tech lead. How is your process similar to Simmer's different? I'm curious how you articulate and think about requirements and how it fits into the overall architecture at at Rappi. Yeah. So the the main difference I would say is. Right now, all, all the stakeholders are pretty pretty technical, um, or you know, they're mostly we're we're focusing on machine learning um, oriented problems, right? So we're not focusing on any other use case at the moment, just because we're at that POC uh, phase. So, but we're definitely seeing the need for to you know to enable I, I wouldn't say necessarily a feature store for everyone not only for for you know uh, back-end processes let's just call them as a you know way to group them um so for example we're we're starting to rely more and more on let's say dbt be a snowflake for you know transformations and just giving people better data right and maybe so that's that's the other thing so as as uh Simo was just saying you you need to understand um what the what the person's trying to do where the team focuses are so maybe uh ui with a you know with a bunch of features Maybe that's not necessarily what a what a what a you know, what a sorry a analyst on our on our end is trying to use or would serve them best. Maybe it's just hey, this is like curated table raw data that you can just go and play. And maybe once you know you know what you want to do with the data, let's just talk again, right? Um, but for my day to day right now is like defining the architecture and and how the feature store is going to be integrated and replacing our current system. Hmm. I like those juxtapositions too. Like what you're really trying to figure out how this is going to plug into what's going on. And Simmer, you were talking about really looking at how are we going to be most effective when I'm looking at the people that are going to be using this. And so what do they need? How, how can they use this? So, uh, so it's good to see both of those. And uh, I'm wondering, like, for Daniel, you were talking a lot about this modularity. Is that a word? I don't know. It doesn't matter. We just, we're going to call it a word. And for the, sure, it is. It is? Cool. Score one point for me. So the idea of, like, 
the modular pieces seem really attractive to you, right? Because maybe you don't need all of the bells and whistles is how I understood it. And I'm looking at like problems that a feature store will solve. And Daniel, you also said this really well too, that feature store is such a broad thing right now. And it's very big. The problems that a feature store can conquer are vast. And so like I'm looking at different problems like discoverability or like um, discovery, sorry, like time travel, training, serving skews, some of this stuff, concept drift. And I'm wondering for you, when you're looking at these modulars, which ones are most important out of these problems that you're trying to solve? And how are you like using these Lego blocks to solve that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I have the an answer for that. I'm going to give my opinion. <laughs> um, right now, I feel like I said, we, we heavily focused on the transformation part of the, those modules. For us, that's the, the hardest one to solve. Um, mostly because you have data arriving from several different kinds of sources. I mean, you have batch data, streaming data, you have data that's backfilled, that's not backfilled. You have data that features that you just need the most recent value and, and data that the, the, you, you don't need, you just need that for batch prediction or for training. So, uh, and I feel we, we heavily focused on that. Um, and we have good enough solutions for the other layers, for the other modules. I mean, we, uh, we have a good solution for storing and serving the features. Uh, we have a good solution, good enough solution uh, for the registry for the features, and we have a good enough solution for monitoring the, the whole pipeline and the operations. Um, but they can be heavily improved upon. Um, for the other four modules, and so the first answer is, the first part of my answer is, the transformation side, in my opinion, is the, the hardest one and the one you should help the data scientist and the data analyst and what, whoever is going to be using your feature store is the one you should should uh, make it easier to for them to declare new features and calculate new features, uh, maintaining the 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 point in time correctness. I mean, make, making it uh, possible to use time travel for the calculated features. That's part of the transformation part, uh, and having online and offline party. That's also part of the transformation part. So, I think every, everything starts there. So that's the most important one for me. Um, I'd say for the other four modules, I'd say storing and serving they are really important. I mean, if you can if you can query and fetch features, what's your feature store worth, right? Uh, so they're really important, and, and mostly you have to have them, uh, especially the, the online storage. It has to, it, it can fail. I mean, at iFood especially, and, and that's not something I, I'd like to to comment. Uh, Matias is part of the anti-fraud team at, at, at Happy, right? Uh, and uh, the anti-fraud team at iFood was one of the, one of the biggest drivers for the feature store. Uh, both the, the team responsible for the anti-fraud rules and the team responsible for the anti-fraud data science and machine learning models. Uh, they won, won uh, how do you say, it? the biggest champions for the feature store at iFood. They won, were one of the first users. Uh, and that's because that's such a critical uh, piece at iFood. Um, and like I said, the, the storage, it, it can fail because mm -hmm. it, it supports so many critical so systems common. right now. Um, for the other two modules, I mean, monitoring and, and registry, uh, monitoring gives you observability on the features. I mean, how much does my feature cost? How long is it taking to be calculated? Um, I don't know, is there any problem, any issue for my feature? Is there any data skew for my features? Um, I mean, that's important, um, but you can postpone it and, and, and work around that for some time. I mean, eventually you have to handle that. Um, and the registry also, you, you have ways of working around a lack of registry or poor registry. Uh, at the end of the day, if you have to, you just ask, oh, is there any feature that solves problem X, Y, Z, um, but yeah, so in my opinion, the order would be that transformation, story and serving, 
then um, one in three and lastly, the, the registry. You know, I, all of you seem to have like the same theme and I've heard this elsewhere from when we, when we had uh, Neil Lathia on, on the, the podcast. You know, you start with the requirements, start with really thinking of like what problems are you trying to solve for who you're trying to solve those problems. And then thinking about like how you went about reasoning about the solution. Okay, are we going to build it? Are we going to buy it? I wanted to bring up Neil Lathia's example where he, what he really did to start is he tried to narrow down the problems into what exactly what did he need to solve. And what he ended up realizing is similar to some of what you guys were saying, he didn't really need all these different things, but right? he didn't need point, you know, what he was looking for primarily was just that a subset of features that were in his production environment weren't always available in his development environment. So that, that lack of parity was really what he was trying to solve. And, and that's where he focused his development or Monza focused their development of his feature store, really just making that available. And what that really turned out to be was just bridging this gap between two data stores, right? One that was for, I think, online use cases was Cassandra and an offline um, store that, you know, was used for training and experimentation and keeping those two in sync um, and, you know, making sure that they're consistent is really challenging. But that was really what he wanted to focus on. And from there, they iterated. And from there, they started thinking about what's important. Um, and I really appreciated that because I'm actually going to be building a feature store in uh, next Q2. And these are the sort of things that I'm thinking about. Like, what do I really need to solve? So I would love to talk a little bit more about that without, I mean, we kind of really went over the requirements and the problems, but maybe we can start leading our way into the solution of, of how we went about reasoning, uh, what we're trying to actually build. What solution are we actually trying to build? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, I feel like there was so much, so many commonality in the way people were describing. Uh, and and uh, David, you basically said the, uh, exactly like the first thing that we needed, you know, I think we also needed to solve was how do we maintain consistency between online and offline store and avoid skewness. Um, and, and surprisingly, a lot of our initial development was driven again by security risk fraud related use cases. Uh, and, and I would say before that, their requirement was like, we want the features available as soon as possible. So I would say their first requirement was around feature availability. You know, make sure, you know, I cannot rely on batch related data, right? I'm predicting fraud right here, right now. So I want my features to be processed as soon as possible. So I would say, the first, the very first requirement was around feature availability, right? Uh, how how soon can you get those real time features to me? Uh, and having those pipelines, uh, you know, with using you know streaming related technologies, making it available, right? We started with Spark, but then we also had now have Flink support. So so like you know, uh, think about what are the what are the most uh, you know latest cutting edge technologies which can really enable those. Uh, low latency requirements for your use cases. Uh, and then as, as the next step was, okay, you know, I have the features, but then I have to first train my models uh, for, 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 you know, serving it. Uh, so then, but I wanted the, the transformation logic to be exactly the same as you are doing it in the real time with what you are using in the off, offline time for training. So then how do we, how do we architect our pipelines now so that, that parity is maintained. So that was the next problem that we needed to solve or basically make sure. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, that was the natural transition. And since then we have been, you know, now, now we are pretty confident that we have been able to maintain that consistency. Uh, I think what people next needed to do was, oh, this team, other team in within, let's say security or fraud team is, is developing this feature and there's another use case that is coming up can I actually reuse all those existing features that other team has developed? How do I get that trust and confidence that my use case can also be served with you, those use cases, right? Now, many times team would be like, hey, I need to get my use case out very soon. So I don't really care about documenting well, putting the right you know, description about what the features are. Uh, so everybody will be you know, a bit lazy in, in making sure they have done a good enough job so that people have people can understand. Uh, so, so our next set of problems are how do we enable this discovery that you know Dimitri has also mentioned about, uh, so so that you know people can actually go and look at the provenance, right? Where did the feature come from? What was the actual initial raw data which originated this feature, all the way to the beginning? Uh, so building that lineage. Uh, so I think that was the, that has been our next set of focus, and we have been trying hard. Right? It's been it's been a, quite a long time. Uh, you know, in capturing that metadata, you know, and what 
because the thing is the team the teams will never you know uh, that's not the usually first thought like we have to do a good job in documenting things so how we can how we can put some kind of a guardrails and uh, some some requirements when people you know describe or write their features when they are registering it so that there is good enough information captured uh, so that discovery could be enabled because without that i think one of the assumption on which again the feature stores are built is that it's going to enable reuse and shareability uh, so the metric around that is like you know given a feature how many other different use cases are using the same features and that can only be enabled when there is uh, good enough uh, you know metadata and uh, you know information captured already so that is the so that has been a, a you know next set of evolution of our platform uh, and now as we are moving further another scenarios are coming like you know something which is common in uh, rest of the pipelines also right and initially it started with elt right so, right oh, sorry yes elt uh, no sorry etl uh, and then now now more and more we are founding elt pipelines right where people want to transform at the very last moment right so so what we are realizing is that many times people want to create uh, features at certain granularity but they want to postpone the transformation at the very last moment because at that time they are, they know at what granularity they want the final feature to be so how do we enable these kind of scenarios also where they can uh, you know uh, do these very last moment transformations i mean there's a lot in what you just said and i want to focus on one specific point that you made which sure. is reuse can only happen with consistency and if we are judging feature stores on their potential to generate you know reuse reusability and and kind of reduce the lift to use certain features um we need to ensure that consistency and my question to all your panel all the panelists is how do you guys ensure consistency in your transformation logic and in your process for generating different features i'm i'm speaking very specifically actually because this is a challenge i'm struggling with that work right now you know we have a lot of different experimental methods that we work with we have you know i'll give you a simple example we have one metric where we compare a gold standard data set um to an incoming data point and that gold standard data set will evolve right uh, and our challenge i face right now is do we do we version it through code and data or do we version it through documentation and communication and writing you know it's i'm curious how do you guys look at the balance between those two to ensure this kind of consistency across your feature feature stores transformation logic etc maybe I'll kick it to Matthias uh well that's actually one of the problems that we're dealing with as well um i feel like we haven't come up with a with a nice solution to that yet we're we're hoping that uh you know working with this um with this vendor is going to actually enable us to really get that down because like like you just said like there's this problem of it it can have many different uh shapes right so what you just said or even like i was thinking that the the feature store is kind of like a model in a sense that it's garbage in garbage out right so if if you're if the data that's that's actually incoming to the to the store is in any way uh distorted or you know it has the quality issues um your feature values i mean your your transformation api can be great your uh, logic can be great but then the actual feature values are not going to be good and 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 then that's kind of like a more difficult problem to solve so it's a lot of times has to do with upstream um checks and 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 like as simple it can be as simple as hey you know the 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 backend team that's generating the data that we're consuming to get into the store they're the ones that's that that should you know uh have more like it's a thing of awareness right so they every team should be aware that possibly the data that they're producing is the most or the second most important thing they're producing right so it's either 
the the actual logic and what the what 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 this what the team is enabling other teams or a client or a customer, you know, if it's a customer facing thing or app or anything. Uh, but then data is either the first or the second most important thing. So um, one of the challenges that we have as you know data professionals is to go and kind of evangelize everyone into the importance of uh, checking the data that they're producing every time, right? Mm. So I, I feel like that's one of the key things that's not going to be uh, solved by a library framework or you know any sort of system. It's a people and awareness problem. And that's, that's where we're trying to frame that. I'd love to hear from some other people on this because I think that's a, isn't it such a good question. Uh, can we just hear from everybody on, and get your hot takes on it? Uh, Daniel, maybe you want to give it a crack. Um, yeah, I mean, um, what, what I just said about coverage in, coverage out, uh, that's the sad truth for most, uh, how do you say, early systems, early developed systems. Um, but you have to be. I, I, I do believe you. You have to be able to to have your own checks in place. I mean, you, you have to be able to to monitor the the quality of the data that's coming in, so you're able to assess the quality of the data that's coming out, and maybe break the pipeline, call the cops, handle, the, fix the issue before you continue produ producing data, because otherwise you're just going to propagate the garbage. Um, that's also something that we are not handling uh, right now at iFood. Uh, I mean, not at the feature store level. We do have some some initiatives in place for the data lake, and our feature store right now is, is uh, uh, how do you say it's tightly coupled with our data lake. Our data lake is our source; it's a streaming data lake. So. Um, that, that's one of the biggest questions, biggest issues we do have to, to answer right now. There's uh, lots of companies tackling this. Uh, we're looking to, to some vendors to, to help us with the data observability and data quality checks. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I believe that has to be baked in every system. Everyone that produces, like, I, I think it was Matthias that said, everyone that produces data has to be responsible for the quality of the data that's being produced. Uh, data, I, I, I'm going to give an example, an example here that I think. So uh, someone uh, generates an event in the, in the application, in the mo mobile application, that has to be some quality checks on there, and then that, that gets ingested into the data, data lake, quality checks there, ingested to the feature store, quality checks there. I mean, you have to, to have quality checks everywhere. Um, but yeah, right now we, we're still uh, tackling these. This is not an easy, easy issue to, to fix. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the point you guys both made, which is really data is the responsibility of everyone. Everyone should know. And not only is it the responsibility of everyone, to some degree, it is, the prim it is part of the primary value they generate to the company. Because how increasingly as organizations become more and more data driven, we need access to that data to know how teams are doing, know what they need. And if teams aren't taking responsibility for that, mm -hmm. they are ultimately, you know, they're making it harder for the company to really empower them. And, and, and as data professionals, we know that intuitively we work with data day to day, but ops professionals, product all across the, the company, they may not know that as intuitively because they're not confronted with that problem on a day to day basis. So, so, so really, really great points from all you guys. I just want to close out the topic here with Simmer, just kind of circling back to you, you know, in terms of versioning that transformation logic, versioning the knowledge that goes into creating feature stores and allowing them to be reusable and consistent. How do you guys grapple with that? Uh, and what are the sort of tactical things that you guys have learned that have made, you know, your feature store implementation successful? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, no, as, as I'm saying, like it's still uh, an area of further development. I would say, you know, we have done uh, at least some uh, some good, good uh, you know, improvements over time. But what we have, uh, you know, made as a practice is that anytime when people are creating a new set of features or we call them as feature set or some companies call it feature groups, uh, we, we make sure that during the registration, so we have a registration process, which is the, 
mechanism for capturing the metadata where they have to provide what kind of what kind of features uh, you know this use what type of use cases this feature use for description about the feature set um, right and then what entities are these features associated with because entities again very important uh, so that because most of the time use cases will be very driven by entities right the like is it for this type of user is it for this type of company the features are uh, so what entities are they associated with right and then for each set of features within the within the feature set you know we ask again all those metadata around again description at a feature level uh, then what what is a type of this feature right uh, data type of this feature uh, and so so the point is like you know first making sure there is the the schema of the feature set the feature is properly captured and then what we have done in conjunction with that once it is captured is stored in a uh, in a feature catalog so we have a catalog mechanism also where uh, it's actually you know data catalog for everything but you know it also contains features because it's another in, uh, asset within the catalog uh, so people can actually go and search for you know features as if they are searching for any data sets and then they get all that information which was captured during the registration process and uh, uh, you know where we want to take it where we are not yet is that for each of the features they should be able to go to exactly the code within git repo to see what transformation led to this feature because uh, because because i think any data scientist want to know what is a back, in the background what is the transformation logic for this feature if we are able to make that connection you know the, it brings that trust again that yeah mm -hmm. i'm confident i can use it so we continue to make that improvement about how do we how do we get that whole provenance of where the feature is coming from uh, so i think that will bridge that gap and improve shareability reuse of features um, but I think, uh, I mean, that's the, I mean, I would say so that's the holy grail probably of the feature store, like, you know, this whole idea about shareability reuse. Yeah. Just one, one thought, and I was thinking about this the other day with my manager, uh, you know, working on the ML infra side of things, thinking about building the tools and services for data scientists. One thought that I had was that, is, you know, I, I guess a goal, it's more of a goal to bake in good practices into the tools so that it's hard to do the wrong thing, so that it's easy to, have good practice. And I do think that's possible. I've already seen that in, you know, for example, we're heavy GitLab users. And I love that, you know, because we have GitLab in our own Docker registry, everything is containerized and tag and version. Like, and that right there, we get for free. Like everyone that's using that gets that best practice sort of baked in. So one thought I had is that, you know, if I could build, you know, things and services that have good practices baked in and may make things easier you know and it would also you know like we talked like you matthias was talking about the you know ml ops is also about culture it's a cultural problem as well it's a people problem versus just a technical problem um mm -hmm. so i had one thought about that and then also you know like with with the notion of like adding more documentation and processes you brought up about using a schema i think that's actually one one example that i saw from condenas i don't know if i'm pronouncing that company's name right but when they built their feature store they use protobuf to define their scheme and i thought that was really nice because again it's like it it's you have some way to define an expectation or an idea of what you expect out of this feature. And, and the more that we can start baking that into things, the easier I think things will be later on. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that around like, how do you, how do you build, how do you bake in best practices into the services that you offer? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to, to start. Um, and I mean, uh, I've mentioned this earlier, uh, but at I feel that your story is declarative. Uh, that's heavily inspired on, on what the guys at Therapy and Be built with Zipline. Uh, you declare a feature. I mean, you, you have the, the feature name, you have the aggregation type for the feature. Is it a sum? Is it an average? Is it a collect list? Um, you have the data source, and then you, you provide the attributes for the feature. So that's both uh, documentation for what the feature is and how is it going to be calculated but also the user does not provide a calculation logic. He, just, he, she, he or she just says, okay, I want this feature to be an average, say average of the order of the ticket price a user paid in the last seven days. You provide also a window uh, window frame. Um, and that's it. I mean, the, 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 the calculation logic is, is handled inside by us. Uh, all the other pipeline from calculating and storing and processing those data and making making that available. Uh, we handle that inside. And also for the query part, we have APIs both for the offline features and point in time and time travel features. 
and also for the uh, online world agency access. So, I mean, uh, it's still possible for you to do something wrong. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you have to to specify, say, I want the average ticket price. If you set the, the wrong value for the ticket price, it's not going to be the average ticket price. Um, but it makes it harder to, to do the wrong thing. And, and uh, I mean, that's one thing we do. The other thing, and, and that's something we're still, it's still up for grabs. I mean, we, we're still thinking whether that's the right choice or not. Um, but since the, the features, they are declarative, they are 10, 15 lines of Python code, uh, we do review all of them. We, we have a, a review process for the creation of the features. The repository for the features is centralized and the review process uh, is also centralized. I'm not sure that's going to scale. Uh, that's one of the questions we have right now, whether this, this model will work in the long run. Um, but right now it does. Uh, so, so we do, do have uh, also manual revision in place for the features. Got it. Um... Simmer, curious, how do you guys bake in, you know, some of these best practices into the tools? I, you know, I can tell from 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 your previous answer that your team is, you guys can get a lot of buy into your processes. I love how thoughtful the processes are that you described in terms of the metadata. How do you do that and you know, how, how your users are using your tools? Yeah, uh, I mean, what, what we have done is that one thing is uh, we have always focused is that how do we make all these use uh, these tools self served? Um, so we 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 wanted. I mean, what we are saying is that we wanted to accelerate you all guys, all different personas, and we are we are making these tools as self served as possible, and we will provide you all the mechanisms by which uh, you know you you have to you know as as uh, daniel was saying like declarative as much as wherever you can use maybe declarative approach uh, but if there are more sophisticated users like machine learning engineers they can actually get into the whole uh, you know coding mechanism they they want to write their own code and everything so there there is like you know we have defined i would say it, it starts with uh, with you know with that mindset changing the mindset like you know uh, making people getting to the habit of, right, what is the value here? The value, you know, when you are producing feature, there is somebody else could also be a consumer and tomorrow you could become a consumer. So you want others, like write it in a way, provide us the metadata right, in a way as if you want to consume somebody else's features. Uh, so that kind of a mindset, I, I don't think we can force people to do that, but it's all about, uh, you know, giving them examples. So like once we have good enough examples, uh, you know, when you have critical mass in your feature store, uh, which you can then show to other users like how valuable this could become, then they realize the value, uh, right? Uh, but I think initially you need that critical mass, uh, enough enough number of use cases running on your feature store to go out and actually st start talking to different teams, uh, showing them the value. Um, so, so I mean, in the beginning, it's difficult, right? It's like, you know, not everybody buys into this whole idea about, you know, wh why do I have to do it the way you are telling me to do it? You know, I, I can build it in my way and it, it gives me much more control. Uh, but I mean, you work closely with, working closely initially with specific groups, getting good enough number of use cases, uh, following, as I said, the best practices on documentation, uh, uh, data, uh, like feature cataloging, uh, telling them why is it important to have that consistency of feature record across online and offline store, uh, and how can it make their life easier when they have to do training? Uh, and then once you know, once there is, a, I would say it takes time. You know, when when you have a good enough number of use cases and driving value out of that, and how they are accelerating. Now earlier teams used to take maybe months or to develop their use cases. But once we give them these tools, they're able to do it within weeks. Uh, and many times they don't have to actually do a lot because features are already there. So so I think it's it's all this value yeah. propositions uh, that you have to put in front of them. It takes time. Uh, but I would say initially work with some few limited set of teams, uh, show the success, uh, sell it, uh, evangelize it, and once you have, you know, good number of use cases, then it becomes a little more easier. That's a great answer. And 
I'm thinking we got to get Matias to give us his his two cents on this before we eventually round this out. I've got one last question for us after this, but that we're coming to an end. Matias, what do you think, man? Well, yeah, just uh, quick. Um, I definitely agree with what what uh, Daniel Smar just said. You know, um, but then what what we're doing um, apart from what they just said is the way we're we're going about this uh, proof of concept that that we're starting to develop is uh, we're not gonna develop that in a vacuum. We actually got uh, people from five or six different teams um, that are going to be, that are part of that, you know, quote unquote, uh, squad, a uh, feature store squad that we're putting together. So it's, you know, uh, we're not, I mean, we're working on one specific use case that we're going to migrate, which is the fraud one, but, uh, then the, the idea is that we're going to develop this thing uh, in a way that they everyone knows what, what they'll have to do to migrate their own stuff into the feature store or how they're going to interface with it or how they're going to use it. So, and, and we can then bake into the process of developing the you know, ideas from everyone else and what their use cases are and, and where it's gonna, you know, if we're going to have to modify in some way to actually serve that use case, or if you know they talk with someone else that uh, you know from another team that's not being part of the of the of the POC process, then they'll be able to you know let us know. So uh, it's just one people from from each team, hmm. and we're all putting in the work and 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 dividing that up. So you know it's like it's it, if we want to make this work for the whole company we have to take people from 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 most you know of the company to actually work on it to be able to deliver value to everyone that's that's the way we're thinking about it and 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 just as part of that process it should you know come with everyone's best practices uh to to actually improve all that yeah yeah that makes sense it's like they bring it with them and yeah they're able yeah, to yeah. tell what's what they like, what they don't like. And I'm sure Simmer gets that all day long. <laughs> he, he knows how that works. So people that are very happy or not so happy, very opinionated. Yeah. And so my last thing, it's not really a question, to be honest. It's more of like every time I talk about future stores with somebody, I try and like start a movement around this idea of, and especially since you all are here and you're core builders and users of feature stores, can we like try to rally around an idea of getting a little bit of gamification involved in these feature stores where you can see like different badges of people who are creating the most expensive features or they're creating the most used features or they're you know they uh they have different like titles of the features and then you get to see like oh yeah that guy he created that feature that was like 40 grand don't ever use that feature <laughs> so i mean i guess it's more for you simar because you're kind of falling into this and you get you're building the product out uh have you thought about that before? Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. In fact, in like we have kind of thought about that. Like, uh, so so internally, like we uh, like we have company batches for different. Uh, like some when some whenever we want to promote people using more and more of a specific service, you know we, you know we haven't done that yet. But this idea has has come into my mind where, you know, if somebody successfully builds a a feature pipeline using the let's say a feature store that we have developed then we will give them a like you know some kind of a <clears throat> batch saying oh this person has successfully onboarded to our mm -hmm. feature store maybe as a beginner then if they have done 10 such use cases they become a little more you know advanced or something like that so i think that's that's a great point you have brought uh, it gives them an incentive because sometimes people get excited about getting those batches right totally. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I would say that's a great point. Uh, and this thought has come, but we haven't got a chance yet to implement that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just think it would be, I mean, 
I would love to see something like that. And especially <laughs> at these companies that are huge and you get to with, like you said, it's such a small thing, which is a badge, but people get excited and hopefully they use it and they use it in the way that they should be using it. Right. So that was just what I wanted to finish up on. Uh, unless anyone else has anything, anything important to say, what we didn't get to, and we may have to have like another session on this completely. Uh, it just popped into my head when it comes to the ideas of, of badges and whatnot is the idea of security because data is so important and the security and who gets, uh, what levels of security with what features and what data and so how you all are going about that i would have loved to have de dove into but we uh yeah we got shut i mean i would love to just to get matthias and and, and daniel's point on the gamification point you know you started off with that point at dimitrios and i was not sure where you were going but it's actually kind of brilliant <laughs> So I want to hear what Daniel and Tia had to say about it. Um, yeah, I, I even raised my hand here in Zoom. <laughs> uh, we do have some some gamification uh, initiatives here. Life not for the feature store. That's a great idea. That's like I said, brilliant. Uh, but we are heavy Tableau users, um, and, and Tableau is. I mean, you have a a ring pop. Too. You have a learning curve, right? So to, to encourage uh, people at, at iFood to, to take the courses and to learn and, and to actually uh, educate themselves on how to use Tableau, we have exactly that, we gamify, we gamify Tableau. So if you complete one course, two courses, you get different badges, you get some, get some, some perks and bonuses. Um, and, and it worked really well. I mean, the, the, we had a really, really huge spike in the, the number of certified Tableau users. Um, that's a great idea, actually. I, I'm going to talk with the, the, the people in my team on how to yes. do that for, the, for our feature store. Yeah, we should yeah. be here more often talking to Dimitros. He... <laughs> I got all <laughs> kinds of ideas that probably aren't the most <laughs> useful for like the company, but whatever. Uh, but, yes. but I know no, yeah, I but I really... I really like that idea. I, I, I think the I, I, I was um, listening to you talk to Kevin Stump from Tecton and, yeah. and, and you were saying like, yeah, and, and, and working through that. And I thought, yeah, that's that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> then, you know, most people, when they get to the top, they're going to want like swag. Right, like yeah. a, like a, like a coffee mug or saying that yeah, I built this one, um, but yeah, yeah, I de definitely agree. We we like Daniel was saying, we have some uh, gamification already through the process of onboarding um, uh, new you know people into the company, like um, and and when they're when they're learning about um, different you know aspects of, around compliance and that that sort of thing. So it should it should work like that, you know, um, successfully onboarded, uh, successfully build your own, you know, first feature. And then I really like like the, the vanity metrics, like uh, the most expensive feature, the most used one, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Awesome. Well, it looks like all, all the time we have got has been depleted. And I'm going to leave it up to everyone listening to tell us if you all liked this kind of just conversation style or if it was too many cooks in the kitchen and we spoiled the soup. <laughs> we should go back to one-on-one -on -one or at, at the max two or three people could be, uh, is too much. So I'll let people tell us, but I had a great time talking to you all. I was able to get a lot of insight and I really appreciate each one of you bringing your different backgrounds and aspects to the table and the experiences that you've all had have been crucial in, in helping us to see this in a way that I don't think gets talked about enough. I really, that's why I really wanted to do this is because none of us really have any stake in the game, right? Like we're not trying to sell you a feature store. So it's very, easy for us to tell it like it is and when i got together with matthias and we thought about this like hey do i even need a feature store i think after talking it through for this amount of time the answer is a conclusive maybe 
<laughs> that depends. So yep. we'll keep it at that. <laughs> Anything else you want to say, Vishnu, before we, we rock off? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're going to have a post okay. coming with all the lessons from you guys. Uh, I think it, it, was, it was great to have you. But, you know, just whether it's a data, da culture of data and understanding the value of it, whether it's, you know, thinking about feature stores in terms of reusability, or whether it's just how hard it is, you know, to get everyone on the same page with respect to way data is, you know, being generated and then used in these features. I learned a lot, a lot that I'm going to definitely take to work uh, in a few hours. So uh, thank you guys for joining. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. We'll see you all later. Thank you guys.